Now more than 10 years ago, Colgan 3407 was the last fatal airliner crash in America. It is also one of the most influential. A wide range of changes to pilot recruitment, training, and rest requirements were a direct result of the tragedy. In this video, we look at exactly what occurred and how it is impacting aviation to this day. Before examining the story of Colgan Flight 3407, it is important to understand how and why an aircraft stalls. A plane flies as a result of airflow around the wing. As air over the wing accelerates, it creates a region of low pressure, sucking the wing up. The two main variables are speed and angle of attack. As airspeed lowers, a higher angle of attack is required to achieve the same amount of lift. However, when the angle of attack increases past the critical angle, a sudden reduction in lift will occur, as airflow above the wing becomes turbulent. This is the stall. Stall recovery is taught from the early stages of pilot training, and involves increasing power and decreasing angle of attack. While this is a fairly basic procedure, it does result in some loss of altitude. Therefore, an aircraft is most prone to a stall at low airspeeds and low altitudes, or in other words, takeoff and landing. Here, pilots are required to monitor their airspeed closely, as the best protection against a stall is prevention. Colgan 3407, descend and maintain 2300. Okay, down to 2300. Colgan 3407. 23 alt cell. Let's uh, do vertical speed. Colgan 3407, turn left heading 330. Left heading 330, Colgan 3407. Left 330, we're in heading mode now, going to Blue Needles now. Colgan 3407, a Bombardier Dash 8 Q400, is on approach to Buffalo International Airport on February 12th, 2009. It has flown from Newark International, just under an hour's flight. The time now is 10.12 p.m. The crew has encountered some icing conditions during their descent, and have their ice protection systems turned on. Have you got ice on your side? Yeah, I've got some on the side of my windshield here. Do you? Lots of ice. That's the most I've seen on the leading edges in a long time. A plane can accumulate ice on its wings when flying through visible moisture at temperatures below freezing. Ice makes a stall occur at lower angles of attack, as it disrupts the airflow over the wing. Therefore, when his ice protection is on, the Dash 8 stall warning, or stick shaker, is programmed to activate earlier, at a lower angle of attack. Let's do a descent checklist, please. Descent checklist. Altimeters 2980 set cross-checked. 2980 set cross-checked. Fuel balance check. Pressurization set and cabin PA complete. Descent checklist complete. All right, and if you want to go ahead with the approach checklist? Yeah, sure. Approach checklist. Approach and landing brief complete. Uh, complete. Bug set. Set. GPWS landing flap. Selected 15 degrees. Fuel transfer off. Hydraulics checked. Caution warnings check. Seatbelt signs on. External lights on. Approach checklist complete. Rock and roll. With strict speed limits in place for the approach into Buffalo, the captain begins to slow down. To do this, he reduces the power to idle and extends the flaps. Flaps 5, please. Colgan 3407, turn left heading 260. Maintain 2300 until established localizer. Cleared ILS, approach runway 23. Left 260, 2300 till established and cleared ILS 23 approach. Colgan 3407. All right, approach is armed. Roger. Gear down. Colgan 3407, contact tower 120.5. Have a good night. Uh, over to tower, you do the same. 3407. Gear is down. The airspeed is showing a relatively healthy 175 knots. However, with the wheels down, flaps partially extended, and propellers at high RPM, it is about to start reducing rapidly. The speed will decrease into the low speed queue, and soon after the stick shaker will activate. This is to warn pilots of an impending stall. There is still some margin above the actual stall though, and if a pilot applies the correct technique, 
of increasing power and decreasing angle of attack, a recovery is probable. The following is an animation produced by the National Transport Safety Board. It provides a highly detailed and accurate depiction of the following events. I uh, put the flaps up. Should I put the gear up? Gear up? Oh shit! The Dash 8 crashes five nautical miles to the northeast of Buffalo International, impacting the family home. The accident kills all 49 occupants of the plane, as well as one individual on the ground. The progression from safe flight to undesired aircraft state to crash took only seconds for Colgan 3407, showing just how deadly a stall can be. The stick shaker first activated 20 seconds after 10.16 pm. The plane was not yet close to stalling at this point though. The NTSB estimates that the pilots had up to a 22 knot warning of a potential stall, which makes the following actions by the captain almost inexplicable. The response should involve releasing back pressure on the stick and pitching down, as well as increasing power, thus reducing angle of attack and increasing airspeed. However, when the stick shaker occurred, the flight data recorder shows that while power was increased, the control columns were moved aft, pitching the aircraft up. This increased load factor and angle of attack, while airspeed reduced to 125 knots. Airflow over the wing then became turbulent as the critical angle was exceeded, and the aircraft stalled, rolling to the left due to the asymmetric position of the ailerons. There were several of these roll oscillations in the following seconds. What could have saved the flight was the Q400 stick pusher. It activates in response to a stall, applying a force to push the control column down, the most important step in stall recovery. The stick pusher activated three times, however, did not have an effect due to the actions of the captain, who responded by increasing back pressure. He overrode the pusher with a pull of up to 160 pounds of force. The aircraft finally collided with the ground, nose and right wing down. We'll come back to the captain's inappropriate response to the stall. But the best protection against a stall is prevention, so how did the pilots miss the big clues that a stall was imminent? Air traffic control requirements at busy airports often involve rapid slowdowns. The captain achieved this by extending the flaps, reducing power and increasing propeller RPM. This manoeuvre is not unsafe or unusual though if flown properly with a high level of attentiveness. The low speed cue should have made the captain aware of the rapidly reducing speed, with 18 seconds between the first appearance of the cue and the onset of the stick shaker. The first officer also should have been monitoring the airspeed during this critical phase, but she was busy performing other tasks, including lowering and monitoring the landing gear, talking to ATC and communicating with the flight attendants. So what caused this low level of awareness from the crew? Fatigue likely played a role. While both pilots had legally adequate rest periods, the captain, away from his hometown, had reportedly slept in the crew room and the first officer, who also lived away from Buffalo, had caught two overnight cargo flights to get to work. While both pilots had ample sleep opportunity, the lack of quality of their rest likely contributed to fatigue. The first officer also appeared to be affected by illness and mentioned this several times. Ugh, I'm ready to be in the hotel room. I feel bad for you. This is one of those times that if I felt like this when I was at home, there's no way I would have come all the way out here. If the pressure's too much, I could always call in tomorrow. At least I'm in a hotel on the company's buck. But we'll see. I'm pretty tough. The accident report stated that the pilots were likely affected by fatigue and illness, but could not conclude that these were the sole contributors to their failures in the accident sequence. What was also a contributor was the lack of adherence to sterile cockpit procedures. Sterile cockpit rules prohibit non-operational conversations in the cockpit during critical phases of flight, below 10,000 feet. However, the crew engaged in several non-pertinent conversations during the descent. Lots of ice. That's the most I've seen on the leading edges in a long time. 
With all of my hours in Phoenix, I didn't really have much time in actual, or in any ice. I had more actual time on my first day here than I did in the 1600 hours I had before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding, on the first day. Well, that sounds... Uh, well, I mean, I, I didn't have 1600 hours. I got hired with 620. Oh, wow. The casual conversation led to the descent checklist being completed much later than usual and little consideration was given to the potential icing threat. The accident report was critical of the crew's communication, saying that they squandered time and attention which should have been used for operational tasks and monitoring. It created an environment that impeded timely error detection. There are several explanations into why the crew didn't notice the impending stall, but for why the captain could not recover had just one, lack of, and possible negative training. Airline pilots are required to be checked in a simulator at least twice a year, so they can practice any non-normal events which may occur in flight, of which stall recovery is included. The stick shaker occurrence likely took the captain by surprise. He seemed to be startled and confused by the warning. The accident report links this to the way stalls are trained in the simulator. While in the accident sequence, the stick shaker occurred with the autopilot and ice protection on, stall training in the simulator was hand flown by pilots. Secondly, the simulator training was performed as a pre-planned maneuver, removing the key element of surprise. What was so detrimental to the flight was the captain's response to the stall warning. Instead of applying the proper technique, he pulled back, increasing the angle of attack and stalling the plane. This can be linked to the fundamental way in which stall recovery was assessed in the US. Prior to the accident, stalls in flight tests required pilots to recover from a stall with minimum altitude loss. In airliners, this promoted a technique of increasing power but not reducing angle of attack, as doing so would lead to a loss of altitude. But this left a significant gap in the skill sets of airline pilots, as the power out technique would simply not work in a fully developed stall, where a reduction in angle of attack and at least some altitude loss is required. The captain's response to the stick shaker can be described as an exaggerated version of this flawed technique, and there were clues that he struggled with over controlling aircraft in his history. He failed multiple check rides in the past where his basic aircraft control was lacking. The NTSB concluded that additional oversight could have helped the captain achieve the skills required for safe flight. The accident of Colgan 30407 was one of the most influential crashes in the US's history. It was a catalyst for change across numerous parts of aviation. However, whether these changes actually had relevance to the crash's contributing factors is another thing. There was public pressure placed on the FAA due to the relatively inexperienced crew. The captain had less than 700 hours when initially hired by Colgan, the first officer just under 1500. It was claimed that this contributed to the accident, and thus the now famous 1500 hour rule was introduced. Unique to the US, this requires all pilots to obtain 1500 hours before being hired by an airline. Still in force today, the rule significantly limits the progression of pilots, and requires them to spend years flying in general aviation before being considered experienced enough for an airline. However, there were no contributing factors listed in the accident report to do with pilot experience, and both the captain and first officer had well over 1500 hours at the time, more than enough hours to know how to recover from a stall. What was listed as a factor was the captain's history of checkride failures, clues that he may not have possessed the aptitude for advanced instrument flying. This issue was addressed in the accident report, stating, Remedial training and additional oversights for pilots with training deficiencies and failures would help ensure that the pilots have mastered the necessary skills for safe flight. In response, the FAA introduced the Pilot Records Database which allows airlines to see the full check and training records of any pilot applicant. Fatigue rules were also adjusted in response to the crash, increasing the amount of rest pilots require between duties and decreasing the maximum hours which can be flown in a day. While on the surface this addresses the contributing factor of fatigue, it also does not fully speak to the problem. Both pilots had enough rest time prior to the flight, well above the minimum legally required time. It was the circumstances of their rest which led to fatigue, due to both crew members being away from their hometown, 
The NTSB referred to this in their report's contributing factors, saying that pilots have the responsibility to manage their time in a way which allows sufficient quality and quantity of rest, and airlines need to identify risks and implement strategies to deal with the challenges of commuting pilots. It is this commuter issue, which is still a norm in regional airlines today, which has the potential to produce dangerous levels of fatigue amongst pilots. While it cannot be denied that Colgan had an impact on aviation in the US, there is an argument to say that there was an element of knee-jerk reaction which led to a number of the new rules, such as the 1500-hour rule and the adjustment of the fatigue regulations. And there may still be areas which need to be fully addressed, like the issue of low income for regional pilots, forcing many to commute hundreds of miles to get to work. The tragedy of Colgan 3407 should not be lost amongst the controversies, however. 49 people lost their lives on February 12, 2009, all of whom were expecting to land safely when they stepped onto the aircraft. There have been no fatal airline crashes in the US since Colgan 3407, so taking a trip by air is still an extremely safe way to travel. And despite some issues, the US is still a world leader in aviation safety.